Welcome to another study with me video looking through some quantum mechanics and looking at the mathematical foundations for describing ideas in quantum physics. So if you're following along on the Brilliant website I'm going to be working through part of the collapsing states module. Now we've been dealing with a lot of probabilities so far in this course and we've been making a mathematical framework that you might recognize here. This is a way of representing a probability of observing an outcome uh, and it's from an inner product or a bra ket notation. Now one thing to know and keep in mind is that you know through all of this mathematics it's still impossible to know exactly what state is going to result from say an experiment. Um, these probabilities here that we can write are just the probability observe of observing each outcome um, but we never know exactly what is going to happen and this I guess was a bit of a disturbing part of quantum mechanics especially in the early days and I think even Einstein had a quote saying God does not play die with the universe when he initially rejected this idea that quantum mechanics comes down to probabilities and that there is an inherent randomness to reality but as I understand it, and I think the way that, you know, most people in quantum mechanics agree on is that there is this inherent randomness or probability to quantum events. So it's a little bit unsettling. Um, but what I'm going to talk about in this video sort of centers around the idea of what is going on during measurement, because this all sounds a little bit strange. So let's keep reading. Now, this again is the um, experiment that I've looked at in a few of the previous videos. It's the Stern-Gerlach experiment. You take a unknown ket, so this is a state, but we don't know anything about it. We put it through this analyzer, which in the z direction, that's the straight up and down direction here. It separates it out into being either spin up or spin down. These are also states um, described by the ket notation. Now, um, as a bit of a reminder, our unknown ket, or psi, which is like our wave function that we input, can be written as a linear combination, some a amount of the spin up state and some b amount of the spin down state. This is called the SZ basis because, well, Z are just our basis vectors in the up-down you know, direction. These A and B values are scalars, so I guess they're numbers, and they are the probability amplitudes um, of being spin up or spin down. So you could also write A and B like this, where A is the inner product between spin up and our unknown state. This kind of makes sense because the inner product, remember, is an amount of overlap. So the probability of being, you know, how much you are spin up, is the overlap between spin up and your unknown input. Yeah, just keep in mind that that's how you can write these A and B amplitudes and let's keep going. So this line here is just rewriting what we had on the previous page, um, but instead of writing A and B here, they've replaced A and B with the inner product version or the inner product notation. Um, so yep, this whole line here is scalars times by state kets, in this case A times spin up and B times spin down. Now a scalar is like a number, you're probably familiar with it, you can change the order of multiplication so it doesn't matter which order you do multiplication and if you're dealing with a scalar value. So we can actually move these inner products um, you know, behind this state kit and actually what we get when we do that is this next line down here where they've also taken the unknown state kit out of the brackets because it's common to both terms. This allows us to get a look at these terms in here, a uh, double up arrow or a double down arrow, and these terms are called outer products. Um, they are multiplied in the opposite order of the inner products. So you might recognize that they look a bit funny compared to what we're used to dealing with, which is the inner product. Now these outer products can be quite useful. And in fact, if you have the sum of outer products acting on a ket, 
um, it returns the exact same kit unchanged. That's if you have the sum of all the outer products over your basis. Well, here we're representing I to just be like a placeholder. And our basis in this case is an up arrow and a down arrow. So if we have up arrow, up arrow times the kit, plus down arrow, down arrow times the kit, we just end up with the kit itself. We've summed over our entire basis and we get the same kit out at the end unchanged. The reason that we get the same kit out unchanged is because multiplying by the sum of the outer products over the whole basis is like multiplying by the identity or multiplying by one. Anything times one will just give you that thing you started with. Now this might seem a little bit pointless, but it can come in handy because applying a sum of outer products is a way of expressing any state as a sum of the contributions of each basis kit. So it's a way of writing out the state in terms of everything that makes it up. And you might see that that comes in useful later. All right, so we have a question here, um, basically about determining the form of an outer product, like what actually is this outer product? What do these products yield when multiplied by an unknown state psi? So that's when we just multiply one outer product by the unknown state and not summing over the entire basis. What do we, ha what do we get if we just times, um, say, up, up? by our unknown state. Well, what happens is they produce their own eigenstate when they are used on any state. Now, I don't think we've spoken about what an eigenstate is, but we can have a look at it here. It's basically, it returns a scalar value. It returns some multiple of itself. When an outer product for a particular state, say spin up, acts on an unknown state, psi, it produces its own state kit with a scalar factor. Okay, so if you were to do the outer product of spin up, spin up on psi, you would get out the spin up state kit with some scalar factor A. So we can work through this a little bit more slowly. We started with our familiar unknown state psi, which is made up of A amount of spin up and B amount of spin down. We applied the outer product of spin up to it. And this line here is just rewriting this, but in a, just rearranging it. We've taken what was out the front and put it down the back. So we've taken that um, kit that's hanging out the front, we've put it behind and that gives us an inner product times a kit, which we recognize from before as being A times the kit, because we know that this inner product here is equal to A. That was something that we just went over. All right, so applying an outer product to something, so an unknown state, actually makes it end up in a known state. We, we, we've gone from being in an unknown state to being in some multiple of spin up. So we've actually, you know, changed the state that this quantum particle is in. So this might be summarized on the next page a little bit. Yeah, it's a mathematical tool that mimics the effect we first observed in chapter one. Um, so that's what I spoke about in the last video and that is that a measurement can disturb the system and collapse the state. Quantum measurements cannot be made without disturbing the state, except in the case where an input state is the same as the output state. That's like if you're measuring something twice and you already know what it is, you're not going to change it there. This is a radical departure from classical me measurements. The collapse of a quantum state also makes quantum mechanics irreversible. Again, this is in stark contrast to classical mechanics. Once an input state psi is observed in state spin up, then the output state is no longer psi, but has been collapsed into spin up. In effect, the analyzer prepares that state and removes the possibility of any other state being observed. This collapse is equivalent to an application of the outer product or projection spin up, spin up for the up state. So once a neutron emerges from the up channel, it's not in the state psi anymore. It's now in this projection or outer product times psi, which we know is 
a times spin up, it's in a different state. We can use this um, new knowledge of defining probabilities to look back at one of the experiments we've discussed in a previous video. That's the one where we take a input neutron, which we know to be spin up, we put it through an X analyzer, the Zerstern Gerlach analyzer, to measure it as either spin left or spin right, and then we again measure its Z direction of spin, so either spin up or spin down. So we can work out that the probability of being on this yellow path would be a quarter. There's a 50-50 chance here and another 50-50 chance here. Um, so to go all the way along the yellow path would be one quarter and that's the way that we would write it out. Likewise for the pink path it would be one quarter. And you know with classical probabilities that would be like this, um, we would say okay there's a quarter of a, proba quarter of a probability being yellow, quarter probability being pink, so if we sum both of those paths, a quarter plus a quarter equals a half. And we would expect in this final experiment for half of the neutrons to come out spin up from this output place here. If you've seen the previous video of mine in the series and remember it, that is actually not what we see. We don't see a 50-50 chance here at this final analyzer. Instead, we see 100% of the neutrons coming out the end as spin up. So there was something that happened along the way where the memory of it being spin up was retained all the way from the start, even though we'd had this intermediate step which usually would completely reset the memory of any of the particles. Because X and Z are orthogonal to each other, we would have expected this to completely reset any information about the spin of the particles and we wouldn't have expected one that had initially been spin up to remain spin up all the way through. So there's something going on here. Uh, Brilliant says what is wrong with our approach? Um, the answer is that this combined channel of spin left spin right neutrons can't be treated as just a mix of different neutrons but instead they are a superposition of spin left and spin right. So we need a mathematical way to represent um, this state, which is a superposition of, I guess, two different options. And when we do that, and I'm going to work through that in the next video, it will kind of wrap up this little section we've been going through. Um, and hopefully our probabilities will give us that this is 100% spin up at the end, instead of what we're currently working with is that we're getting that it's only a half. So I'm looking forward to doing that in the next video and finally having a, a mathematical framework that's consistent with all the experiments that we've seen and all the results that we've seen because currently this classical way of looking at probabilities doesn't work for us. We need something a little bit more. I'm looking forward to seeing you in that next video. I think it will probably be the last one in this Math for Quantum Physics series. Um, and don't forget that if you do want to work through these courses yourself um, and a lot more in depth than I can do it with you, then you can go to brilliant.org slash tibbies and sign up for free. The first 200 of my viewers that use that link can also get 20% off a premium annual subscription um, and I think you'd really enjoy it if you want to go a bit more in depth than what I've been able to do here. But see you next time and keep your questions coming in about this stuff. I think that some of my maths has been improving along the way so I hope yours has been too. See you then.